I'm Eugene Meyer, president of the Federal Society, and by, on behalf of the Federal Society and the American Constitution Society, both of which groups are co-sponsoring this event, I want to welcome all of you here uh, you, uh, to this uh, discussion, conversation on the Constitution with Justice Breyer and Justice Scalia. Uh, all of you should have gotten at one stage or another uh, cards when you came in here. If you want to ask a question, uh, write, write it out and pass it to the aisle. Uh, there will be, on, on occasion, uh, uh, people coming up and down the aisle who, who will take those cards. If you're, on the, if you're on the seat on the aisle, if cards are passed to you, if you could hold them uh, until, at some stage, somebody comes by to get them, we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, with, uh, I, now to introduce our moderator, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa Brown, who's the Executive Director of the American Constitution Society. Thanks, Gene. I just would like to add my welcome to all of you. Um, ACS is really privileged to be co-sponsoring this event this evening. And Justice Scalia, Justice Breyer, we are extremely honored by your presence this evening. Clearly, constitutional issues are the subject of much live debate today, and in both uh, legal discourse and much broader public discussion. And so we're really lucky to have with us what every, who everyone recognizes to be um, the biggest experts in the country on constitutional interpretation. So we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. And we are very pleased to have um, Jan Crawford Greenberg with us this evening to help guide the discussion. Not that I think it will need any guiding. Um, uh, Jan is an ABC News correspondent who covers the Supreme Court and provides legal analysis for ABC News. She has a wealth of experience covering the Supreme Court and national legal issues for both print and broadcast media, from the Chicago Tribune to PBS to CBS and now at ABC. Jan's actually working on a book on the Supreme Court right now, which will come out early next year, so we are in very capable hands this evening. Jan. Thanks. Well, it's my honor to be here, and I thought that we would uh, just start by kind of looking very far back. Um, I wanted to bring up this famous story between two long ago legal titans uh, who had had lunch, Judge Han and Justice Holmes. And as Justice Holmes uh, left the lunch, Judge Hand said, do justice, sir, do justice. And uh, Justice Holmes stopped his carriage and said, it's not my job to do justice. My job is to apply the law. Justice Breyer, are you Holmes or Hand? <laughs> I'd be very happy to be either one. <laughs> And the, the, the short answer is when we have cases, we try to apply the law and get the right answer in the case. And of course, we both think, I believe, that ultimately the point of law is to satisfy a human desire that's probably 10 or 20,000 years old. Uh, that people, of course, want justice. Justice, justice shall you pursue. And they want it, uh, and they expect, ultimately, that the law will help them achieve that very basic and noble end. And we understand what the basic end is, but we also think, or at least I do, and I'm sure Justice Scalia does, that you don't necessarily get to that end simply by trying to look for what is the intuitively nicer result in each case. So we're there to apply the law, but we don't forget what the ultimate objective is. Justice Scalia, what do you think Justice Holmes meant by that? <laughs> let, 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 let me describe uh, probably the, the case that I've, I've had over the last 20 years that I felt produced. I think just to, I, I'm afraid we've lost. Thing is not on. I think it may not be. It's not my fault. Did you do this, Justice Breyer? <laughs> <laughs> The little no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, good. Let, let me it's really coming on and off, and I don't know what to do about it. Let me describe the case um, that I had over the last 20 years in, in which I, I most felt that, that really justice was not being served if I was to be the arbiter of justice. Uh, uh, there, there was a piece of legislation designed to preserve the integrity of uh, American Indian uh, tribes, which prescribed that uh, uh, no, no child of, uh, of uh, 
members of the tribe could be, of any tribe, could be adopted by persons uh, outside the tribe without the uh, permission of the tribal council. And there was a young Indian man and a, a young Indian girl who had had a child. They were not married. And, and, and they had given the child up for adoption by a, a very well-to-do rancher. And as I recall, the child had been with, with these people for two or three years. And uh, the issue was, you know, whether the child had to go back to the tribe, uh, if the tribal council said so. And I, you know, uh, we decided the case, uh, yes, the child had to do it, because that was very clearly what the statute provided. Now, I, you know, I don't think that that was the way things should have come out. I would think that if the child's parents wanted the child to be with someone that they thought would, would best take care of, 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 of their child, that it should be up to them and not up to some tribal council. Nonetheless, it is not my job to say what's uh, justice and what isn't justice. My job is to interpret the law adopted by the people's representatives as fairly as possible. And, and the only fair interpretation of that law w uh, produced that result. Now, I will say that um, I might feel differently if I sat on a trial court. You know, a trial court is much more interested in getting result in the particular case. By the time you get up to an appellate court, and, and lawyers ought to learn this, I don't much care about your particular case. I am not about to produce a better result in your case at the expense of creating terrible results in a hundred other cases, because that's what appellate courts do. They set forth principles that govern an immense number of other cases. So what I'm concerned about as an appellate judge is a legal principle that will produce justice in the sense of giving the fairest interpretation of the statute over a large number of cases. As I say, if I were a district judge, you know, a district judge can, well, you know, those of you who know. <laughs> There are a lot of non-reviewable ways in which he can make the case come out right. <laughs> Justice Breyer, let me, when have you had a case that the conclusion, that the law took you to a conclusion that you found personally repugnant? <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> I, I won't go into specifics. Well, Justice because, Scalia gave us an example. Which, I think those don't come up very often. I think, I think, I think uh, normally uh, the cases that we have where I agree with them very much, and people don't understand this, uh, and, but we're in a court particularly where what we decide, and I just emphasize what he said, what we decide affects 300 million people. And if you try to worry about the equities just before the two individuals before the court, you could really get it wrong in respect to 299 million others. And so that is important. Now, what I think normally happens in our court and in a lot of appellate courts is that the issue in front of us is actually not clear what the answer is, particularly when we divide 5 to 4, 7 to 2, or 8 to 1, or something else. And we, we're unanimous 40 percent of the time. You start getting to those other questions, and uh, we're five, four, maybe 20 percent of the time. And, uh, you start, and it's not always the same five, the same four. And the reason is normally because those words in the statute of the application of the Constitution is really open. Say, so look to the precedents. If the precedents decided it, what's it doing in our court? And uh, if in language decided it, and I'd say even in any, any of the obvious tools that we have. And so when you have those open matters, uh, I might, for example, and I am thinking of a case where the uh, absolutely open, I thought, or pretty open, what this statute really meant, and there were two ways of interpreting it, and one would have closed the habeas corpus door to many prisoners who I thought had done nothing wrong themselves to close it, and the other would have kept the door open. And I opted for the latter interpretation. And I will say, in my mind is the fact, that in a country with traditions of affording justice to everyone and keeping that habeas corpus door open, even to prisoners, where you don't know from the text, where you don't know from the precedents, <laughs> you aren't certain what Congress meant by this language. Let's interpret it 
in accordance with those traditions. And there, I think, is an example of where something like a basic justice, a tradition of providing justice for individuals can influence an interpretation of a judge, of an open language, even in an appellate court. I know the case he's talking about. Yeah. I thought the language was pretty clear. <laughs> 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 but that, you know, that's what makes... Uh, yeah. that, that's, that's I think makes. it said whether it was a state or other collateral proceeding. Mm -hmm. And the issue was whether the word other meant other state proceedings or other state and federal proceedings. I would say the word other, there by itself, is not so clear. Well, Senator, wait, this case, we're talking too abstract. Let's pull us oh, we are? Up. I was talking pretty this concretely. Is are we talking to Ed <laughs> let, me, let, let, let me come back to your original question. If, if people agree with, with, with Holmes and do not want their judges to simply apply their own notions of what's a good rule, but rather to follow as best they can what the people have decided through the, through the Constitution and through the statutes, if that is the case, it follows that you cannot judge a judge simply on the basis of whether you like the outcome of the case, which is normally all you're going to find in a newspaper report. You're not going to find the, the textual <laughs> gymnastics that the judges had to go through to reach the result. You're going to see, did the good guy win, did the bad guy win? And you're inclined to say, if the good guy won, wonderful judges, and if the bad guy won, terrible judges. That's not true unless you believe that every statute ever written produces a sensible result. <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 the ideal rule for, for the honest judge is garbage in, garbage out. You are supposed to interpret the statutes reasonably, even if you don't agree with the result, because it's not up to you to decide what's garbage. And, so if you bear that in mind, you, you, you should be, you should be uh, what should I say, uh, more careful. Uh, to either praise or criticize judges just because you like the outcome or dislike the outcome of their cases. But I'm afraid I misunderstood. Are you saying that there's one case that you can recall since you've been on the Supreme Court where you personally disagreed with the outcome, but that the law, you, you felt bound by the law? There, there are lots. There are lots. And you want me to go into some of them, and I won't because I haven't come here prepared with a list. And uh, you have to read through them, and in cases that produce some outcome that's horrible, I probably disagreed mm. with the outcome. <laughs> but the, 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 but the, the, well, I bet I'm, you I have more than you do. <laughs> right. Right. And the, the, uh, the, but where you're on dangerous ground here, you see his la uh, Justice Scalia's last point, which is that you to evaluate a case, and that, that's why I think one of the reasons that we're pleased that the people here are here because they're interested in the details and they're interested in the cases. And we're, you're on very dangerous ground because you're tempting us, you see, to join uh, in our attack on, uh, we won't say journalists, but we are saying <laughs> the occasional article that doesn't go into it, in our opinion, in sufficient depth, which I'm sure you don't even know about. Well, of course not. <laughs> no. But how do, how do justices constrain their, their personal views? I mean, how do they cabin their personal preferences. Justice Scalia, I would guess that you have a different view on that than you do, Justice Breyer. No, I think we probably both have the same. Uh, it, it, it goes with the job. If you are incapable of, of producing a policy result that you don't like simply because the statute requires it, and I do that all the time. I mean, I, you know, I have... Uh, decided cases preventing agencies from deregulating. For Pete's sake, before I became a judge, you know, I was Mr. Deregulation. I was editor of a magazine called Regulation Magazine, which was all in favor of uh, deregulating. But I've written uh, several uh, opinions which prevented an agency that wanted to deregulate from deregulating because the statute didn't allow it. And unless you can do that, unless you, 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 you can realize that your job is to be faithful to the statute, uh, you're in the wrong job. I mean, you know, run for Congress or something. But, uh, <laughs> uh, see, you see, note, 
the deregulation magazine is called regulation, and now you begin, <laughs> <laughs> you begin to understand why law is a confusing subject. <laughs> but the, 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 I, I think here uh, you say an end that we both think, and I think that's true, uh, that subjective judgment of the judge should not play a significant role in the outcome of the case. But where I suspect, and uh, uh, you know, you can disagree, but where I suspect we tend to disagree is the means that judges will use to bring about that end. And what I usually say, and, and I, th I don't know to a point to which you agree you know, or not, but, but I think most judges, uh, appellate judges in particular, when they face a difficult question of statutory or constitutional interpretation, I think they normally start with six tools. They have the text. They can look to the history. How do those words get there? They uh, can look to the tradition, how those words have come to be used before and after. Precedent, the purpose of the statute, the statutory phrase in question, and the consequences. And by that, I don't mean every consequence in the world. I mean the consequences that are relevant to the purposes in the statute at issue. The Fourth Amendment is about privacy, not speech. The first is about, say, speech, not privacy. All right? Now, I think we all have those six tools. Text, history, tradition, precedent, purpose, and consequence. But I think some of us emphasize the first four and try to avoid the last two. And they think that in doing that, it's less likely that you'll get subjective. I don't think that. I think you have to emphasize in many of these cases the last two, purpose and consequence. And I think there are ways of doing that which are honest, writing down what you're doing, never having a secret or hidden motive, explaining to the reader exactly what's going on in the opinion that act as a significant check on the subjectivity of the judge. And I think that's just as likely to be objective as to rely solely on the first four. And I think it's at least equal 50-50. And if it's equal, I think that emphasizing the latter is more likely to keep the judge in touch with the legislature in a statutory case which is in turn in touch with the people, and that is an appropriate thing in a democracy. Purpose and consequence. The problem with purpose and consequence is that they, they invite subjective judgment. Uh, to decide the purpose of a, of a statute, it depends at what level of generality you look at it. Now, you know, what is usually before us is whether a particular limitation in the statute should be applied or not. Is that limitation part of the uh, uh, statutory uh, disposition? Well, if you say the purpose of the statute is to protect civil rights, and if you, if you do not interpret it to have this limitation upon it, you will protect civil rights all the more. I mean, and therefore, you should adopt that interpretation. The problem is that the limitations in a statute adopted by the legislature are as much a part of its purpose as, as is the general purpose of protecting civil rights. No legislature pursues a general purpose at all costs. There are always some limitations. We're willing to do it up to here, but no further. And so to look at the broad purpose, which is what often happens in, in consequentialist opinions, is simply to beg the question. It's to assume the answer. It's to assume that the limitation was not intended because it would limit the purpose. But that's the whole issue. And the same thing is, is, is true for the consequences. Do you like the con How do you decide to decide it if it'll produce these consequences? Oh, I like those consequences, therefore I should interpret it to do that? Or I don't like those consequences and therefore I should interpret it not to do that? I don't think that's the job of a, of, of a judge. The, 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 the only objective criteria are the words that Congress adopted. And once you get away from trying to give them their fairest meaning, you're, you're in trouble. Just like that word other, it sometimes doesn't tell you whether it means other what. 
and there we're in trouble. And at that point, I think it's important not to confuse the improper use of purpose with the proper use of purpose. I mean, Levin, Judge Leventhal, who was a great judge, once said that uh, the problem with using legislative history is it's like going to a cocktail party and looking over the crowd to pick your friends. Well, that's not a very proper use of it. But that doesn't mean there isn't a proper use. And with purpose, too. Sometimes, in a statute, the more general purpose is the one that will help you answer the question. And sometimes, the more specific purpose, say accompanying a limitation, is what's useful. How do you know which is which? Well, the context will tell you. If a person's lost, and he's driving around, and he says, where am I? The correct answer is not in a car. <laughs> now, how do you know that? Because you have the context in front of you. And the same is true with the use of purpose or the use of consequences. And if a judge is using them to be subjective and write his preferences into the law, that's a misuse. If he's doing it to try to find out what the basic objective is of the legislator, using that to interpret ambiguous words in the statute, that's a correct use. And the only check that we have, or you have, that a judge is doing it properly and not improperly is that the judge writes down the true reasons, explains what he or she is doing, and then people can evaluate. There, there, there was a senator from New England, I forget, which one it was now, but he used to tell this wonderful story about his, his visiting the, the general store and sitting on a, on a cracker barrel and talking to the folks at the store. And one of them said, I haven't seen you around for a while. Oh, I've been down in Washington. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a senator. Oh, down in Washington, eh? And he said, a lot of really smart fellows down there. And that, yeah, oh, yes, indeed. There are very, very many smart members of the Senate and of the House. A lot of fellows down there ain't so smart, too, right? Yeah, that's true. Some aren't. Sort of hard to tell the one from the other, ain't it? <laughs> and that's what, what, what I say to your, your, your of course, uh, of course you should use, perp you say you should use purpose properly and not use it improperly. The difficulty is that you, it, it invites your subjective, your subjective evaluation of what is a good purpose. Well, of course, any Congress that had this limitation on it would be a foolish Congress. So in light of that, I should give more weight to the general purpose. I mean, that's a, just a natural reaction once you get into the business of evaluating purposes, as opposed to reading language and giving its, its fairest weight. So I, you know, I try to avoid that. Yeah. Now, I, I, I will say, I will give you this limited uh, concession. I suppose some readings of a text can be eliminated because they produce a ridiculous result. All right? To that extent, I say consequentialism and purposism has some place. But that's a pretty well, limited... Uh, yeah, but we're making progress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let me ask. Maybe I read this um, wrong, and maybe you were misquoted, but... Do you think that, which, you know, do you, um, do you think the idea of a living constitution is idiotic? <laughs> yes, I, I do not think that the people who, who believe that are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> You, you are, in fact, misquoting me. I never said that. What, what I said was I was describing one of the arguments that is often made in favor of a living constitution. And that argument is, it goes something like, you know, a constitution is a living organism. It, it has to grow with the society that it governs or, or it will become brittle and snap. Now, that, that is idiotic. <laughs> The Constitution is not a living organism. It, it's a legal text. And, you know, and I, I, 
I analogize that statement to the statements that you hear from your stockbroker that the market is resting for an assault on the 12,000 level, you know. <laughs> See the stock market panting at some base camp. And, it's, and that also is idiotic. And the two are equally idiotic. So, now, as to the living constitution, no. I never said that the, the, the notion of a living constitution is idiotic. I was misquoted. Justice Breyer. I mean, if you mean that a living constitution is not living, say like a, a rhinoceros or a walnut tree, <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, that I would be someone who thought that. I, I don't know what I would think. But, but, the, but the, the, the normal way in which the phrase is used, though it's become something of a cliche, and so I don't like to use it because it takes on a pejorative meaning. But I think that underlying the idea was that if you go back to the end of the 18th century uh, and you examine what the founders thought, say, about the Commerce Clause, they didn't think of the Internet, and they didn't think of television, and they didn't think of the radio or automobiles, etc. But they wrote a value into that clause, and that value is permanent, like the value under the First Amendment is permanent. Free speech is a value that's permanent. But how you apply that to a world where social conditions and physical conditions and every other condition is changing continuously. And how you take a, a document that, that applied to four million people or so in 1789 and today has to govern a continent of 300 million people of every race, every religion, every point of view. And you know, with 300 million people, we have 900 million points of view minimum. And uh, how you do that is not obvious, and the Constitution, in the application of it, adapts to the circumstance in order to keep the values the same. Now, well, that's the kind yeah. of thing that underlies that notion, cliché though it is, and I think that which underlies it is certainly valid. If, if, all, if all you meant by the living Constitution is that the Constitution has to be applied to new circumstances that were not envisioned at the time of its adoption, I wouldn't give it the name living constitution, but I wouldn't disagree. Of course you have to figure out how the First Amendment applies to new technologies, to radio, to television, and so forth. That, that's not what the fight is about. The fight is about taking pre-existing technologies, pre-existing realities that were there at the time the Constitution was founded, and changing the answers I've sat with three colleagues, living constitutionalists, who believed the death penalty was unconstitutional. Nothing has changed. No technology uh, alters whether that's a constitutional punishment or not. And yet the living constitutionalist could one day say, ah, because of the new circumstances of our 300 million people, we feel differently about it today than we used to, and therefore I am going to prescribe from the bench that you cannot have the death penalty. That's the kind of thing that I do not agree with in, in the living constitution. It applies not just to the death penalty, it applies to abortion. Abortion existed then, nothing's changed. Nobody thought abortion was, was uh, pro prohibition of it was, uh, was unconstitutional, but living constitutionalists say it is. The same thing applies to, you know, prohibition of homosexual conduct. It, 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 it's not the disposition I'm concerned about. If you want to change things, if these 300 million people want to change things, you don't have to use the Constitution to do it. Use the legislature. That's what we do in a democracy. And it's very undemocratic for the court to say, make the change. It's quite possible for the people to abolish the death penalty, to pro permit homosexual conduct, or for that matter, same-sex marriage, and, and, to, and to permit suicide and all sorts of things. The issue is whether a judge can say, the living constitution has morphed. And so what used to be OK is now not bad, uh, is now bad. That, that's, that's the living constitution I'm talking about, and it's, it's the one that I wish would die. <laughs> uh, the, the words in the example in the Constitution are, are cruel and unusual. Those are the words. It doesn't talk about the death penalty. It's embodying certain values. 
now. I was, we were making a little more progress at the beginning of this, when you can see this. And, and the, 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 you, you have the, a lot more hope for this thing than I do. But the reason I find it complicated and, and, and difficult, the, the, this kind of a question, is maybe I, uh, I mean the, the, the metaphor that, that, that's helpful to me after a certain period of time, and I, I think after a member of our court for a certain period of time, and it does take a time. I, I think you develop a, a kind of view of the Constitution, because we have so many constitutional cases. And you begin to say, what is this document about, really? And, and I think most of us, and I, I know that many of my colleagues agree, and I'd be surprised if you didn't. If you, if you want us to really oversimplify and say, what is it? Uh, this is a document that creates institutions of government of, that, of a democratic kind. Yeah, I agree with that, you see that the heart of this Constitution is democracy. And that means that people, through their elected representatives, decide for themselves what kind of laws, rules, uh, administrative regulations, all kinds of other things they want governing themselves in their cities, towns, and states, and nation. It's their decision. At the same time, it creates a certain kind of a democracy. And that's a democracy that protects basic human rights, assures a degree of equality, divides power, state, federal, in three branches so no one becomes too powerful, and insists upon a rule of law. Now, having said that in general terms, I think you see our job as a job of not interfering with democracy, correct, but a job of guarding the boundaries, because there are boundaries in that kind of constitution that gives tremendous leeway to the legislature, but still that legislature cannot go too far. It cannot exceed the boundary. And we're there, in a sense, like a boundary patrol. Now, some of those questions on the boundaries are pretty difficult. And you've mentioned a few, and I might stay away from too many specifics. But those questions are difficult, and they often divide us. But what doesn't divide us is the fact that the job of a court is still at the boundary. And our job primarily is to preserve that democratic process. I think you'll get nine votes for that one. And of course, that's why I'm glad you're here, because you're participating in that process, etc. And I've written about it and believe it's important. But it's important to keep in mind that while we disagree at that boundary, it isn't necessarily because we think the democratic process isn't important or is important. The question is how you interpret those difficult words, and I begin to repeat myself, so I'll stop. But why should unelected judges be able to invalidate laws that don't conflict with the text of the Constitution? Oh. <laughs> well, where, where is an example? Where well, they don't conflict with the text? I've never heard of somebody oh, say, not right. conflict with the text. Try, the question try, is the word. Try Roe versus Wade, just, Thank just you. for starters. Thank you. Thank you. All in right. any of the book, in any of the opinions, of course, you have words of the Constitution, like the 14th Amendment word liberty, or the First Amendment's word the freedom of speech, which don't explain themselves very often in difficult cases. So then I say, life at the boundary is sometimes tough. It's like I keep thinking of the frontier patrol or something, because it doesn't explain itself. It's a hard question, and you have to have tools to answer it. And you put your mind to it, but the bottom line, if it's unconstitutional, is going to be that it's forbidden by this word or that word or phrase or uh, this part of the Constitution. And uh, there, there is no doubt about that. And, you well, know, it, you what, know it, it's easy to find those phrases, equal protection of the law, no, it's it's due process matter. of law. Mm -hmm. you know, those phrases are empty bottles if you, if you accept the proposition that each generation can fill them up with whatever liquid it wishes. Now, I too believe in democracy, and I think the way it works is this. The majority rules. If you don't believe in that, you don't believe in democracy. Now, in a liberal democracy, which is what we have, there are some things on which the majority does not rule. That's what our Bill of Rights is about. 
The majority will not rule on religion. It will not rule on, on limiting uh, political speech or any other speech and so forth. Unreasonable searches and seizures, the whole list. That's mostly what the Bill of Rights is about. Limitations on the majority, which are applied through the judges. Okay. Who decided upon those limitations, however? The majority. It was the majority itself that imposed those limitations in adopting the Bill of Rights. And whenever the judges go beyond the meaning understood by the society that voted for those limitations, whenever it goes beyond that original meaning, it is in effect adding to those subjects that are driven off the democratic stage. Now, there was nobody who ever thought that uh, due process of law meant that abortion could not be prohibited. It was prohibited for 200 years. Nobody thought it was unconstitutional. Again, I'm not talking about whether it's a good or bad idea. The question is, who decides? If you interpret a Bill of Rights so that judges can decide, oh, yes, uh, we have this empty bottle here. It's called due process of law. And we're going to say that it's a procedural guarantee, to be sure. But we're going to say that some liberties are so important that no process will suffice to take them away. Which liberties are they? We will tell you. <laughs> Nobody would have voted for a constitution that said that, that the meaning of equal protection of the laws, whether it means there has to be same-sex marriage, for example, is to be as determined in the future by the Supreme Court from year to year. Nobody would have voted for a constitution like that. And the only way to retain the democratic process is to recognize that the Constitution has an amendment clause. And those things that the people didn't agree to, such as same-sex marriage, nobody ever thought it's covered by the Equal Protection Clause or anything else. If you want it to be covered, amend the Constitution. Or for that matter, if you want to do it at the state level, you don't even have to amend the Constitution. Just pass a law. That is an interpretation that gives effect to democracy. To, but to allow judges to, uh, to use these, these broad phrases to give them whatever meaning seems sensible today, even though it did not seem sensible to the people who adopted the Bill of Rights, that to me is, is quite anti-democratic. Justice Breyer. Um, at the risk of making this very interesting discussion uh, a little less interesting, um, I, I would guess, and others can know, that, that if you look at the different parts of the Constitution, and there are quite a few words, not that many, it's brief, succinct, and, and very, very valuable to this country, uh, you'll find a lot of phrases, a lot of words, and we frequently uh, measure against those words laws passed by Congress or state legislatures to see if they exceed the boundaries that those words set. I suspect that if you look across 10 years worth of cases, you will discover that between Justice Scalia and, and myself, really the number of times that words say they are exceeded, unconstitutional, or not exceeded, there isn't much difference. And you can't say one person is more willing to strike down laws passed by Congress than another at least if you look at what actually happens in the court. But where in my impression of where the differences tend to lie, and personally, as obvious, the members of our court get on. I've never heard them in the in conference room in 12 years in the most controversial cases. I say this over and over. I have never heard a voice raised in anger. I've never heard one member of the court say something insulting about another, not even as a joke. They really, they really don't. We get on well. We get on well. But we have our differences. And I've tended to think those differences over time, and, and, and ours included, stem less from grand subject matters that command attention of the public and more from an approach to how you go about interpreting that Constitution. And there you've heard some of it, because I, I know that, that Justice Scalia is, is concerned and uh, that, that if I use too much purpose or consequence and so forth. So now I want to raise the level of interest a little. And I'll just say that the normal question here 
since you have criticized to a degree. You're making me nervous. What are you building up to? <laughs> I want to say compared to what? <laughs> compared to what? Because if we go back to your favorite subject, history, and there I have a favorite case. I absolutely do. The favorite case was a case involving the ex post facto clause. And we had to decide whether it had a particular meaning, this or that, and for, uh, in a case in California, where California had passed a statute, and that statute made it criminalized, a serious offense, but it criminalized it 25 years after the statute of limitations had expired. And they wanted to go back and prosecute that person for something they said he did more than 25 years earlier. And did the ex post facto clause apply? And I grant you, it was a very difficult question. And I had to go into the history, which I don't always do. But uh, some, well, it was an issue, and I went into it. Now, what it turned on. Try it. I, you'll like it. Yeah, I did. I did. This is what it turned on. It turned on, I believe, whether a, a, a late, 19th, late 18th century, maybe early 19th century judge who talked about the uh, ex post facto clause, Chase, and listed some conditions there, and really got them from Blackstone, who was an 18th century treatise writer, who in fact was describing a 17th century trial during the, uh, just around the time of the British Civil Wars, which involved something that Parliament had done to the Earl of Clarendon and Bishop Atterbury. And what they had done was, to me, quite obscure. And uh, I, I tried to look up every possible thing in sight, and all I can say, and I shouldn't admit this publicly, that if, if I got that right historically, it was a miracle. And the, 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 I am not a professional historian. And the questions are very often not just difficult from the point of view of open language or even from the point of view of, cur of uh, uh, a purpose and, and consequence, but from the point of view of history. So if we're going to decide all these things through history, let's have nine historians and let us not have nine judges. And uh, they won't get that right with Atterbury and Clarendon either because I happen to notice in the history text, which I accidentally looked up, that, that uh, uh, they were in fact in disagreement. Well, you know, the historical approach also has disadvantages. It also isn't easy. And I believe too, too often it's removed from the roots of what is at issue. <clears throat> which is basically how a value embodied in that constitution applies to a world which is a very complex world and a country that has changed dramatically but has managed to hold together with all these different views and different people, has hold together because people do respect that document and they do choose to decide their differences under law. And uh, I think it's a good thing. In fact, to tell you the truth, and I shouldn't admit this, but I think it's a good thing when you have on a nine-member Supreme Court people who don't always see things exactly alike and who do have different methods of interpretation and different approaches because none of us have, well, you understand. Well, the chief I, I can't even agree. I can't even agree with you. You agree with that. No, I, look, and I, right. I, I, I agree that right. you should have different people with, 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 with different, who reach different results but one would think that after 200 years, there would be some consensus on what we think we're doing when we interpret the Constitution. You know, I mean, this is, these are wildly divergent views. Are we taking broad concepts such as equal protection and due process and asking, what should these concepts mean today? That's one, one view. Or, on the other hand, are we saying, what did these concepts mean when, when they were adopted? Now, as, as for the difficulty of figuring that out, the historical problem, yes, there is a history. I'm not pretending that, uh, that doing it by text and, and the original meaning of that text is perfect, that it's going to solve every problem. But it solves an awful lot of problems, especially the most controversial ones. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of history to figure out that nobody thought the, the, the Bill of Rights stopped a state from prohibiting abortion. Nobody thought that the Bill of Rights prohibited a state uh, from, uh, from criminalizing sodomy. Nobody thought that the Bill of Rights prohibited states from uh, prohibiting assisted suicide. So many of the most controversial questions, it's a piece of cake to decide it. And uh, it is not my burden to prove that originalism and, and this historical approach, what did the people do, what did they decide, it's not my burden to prove that it's perfect. 
It's just my burden to prove it's better than anything else. And the anything else is, is, is the other approach. It's up to the judges what equal protection should mean today, what due process should mean today. This is an immense amount of power in judges. And if you say that my approach should require historians, I cannot understand why your approach should require lawyers. I mean, what, what, what does a lawyer know about, uh, you know, whether, whether there ought to be a right to an abortion or whether there ought to be a right to suicide? Let's put ethicists on the Supreme Court or I'm, what did I learn at Harvard Law School that gives me any capacity to decide these questions uh, more, more properly than anybody else in the country. You these learned are, law. You learned law at Harvard These law. aren't lawyers' <laughs> questions. Once you reduce it to, you know, what ought equal protection mean today? If, if you think that those words are empty bottles, let's be honest and say it's up to Congress to fill those empty bottles. That's the way the British do it. If, if they're empty bottles, you know, and, and we're trying to figure out what does the current society think it ought to mean, Whatever the Congress says, they know what the current society. Th I don't have any idea what the current society thinks. I don't want to know what the current society thinks. Now, Justice Breyer, you've written in your book *Active Liberty* that certain decisions um, should kind of spark participation in, in democracy. So, how do you square that with some of uh, Justice Scalia's points? The abortion decision, school vouchers. School vouchers? I mean, I, my dissent in school vouchers, which I wrote about. I, I wasn't on the court at the time Roe v. Wade was decided. And or Stenberg, I guess. Uh, I'll, uh, I think I won't go for the abortion. But, but uh, the vouchers, I, I think that's a very interesting case and, and, and actually quite difficult. Because it, it's absolutely true historically. It had to do with the, the meaning of the Establishment Clause. And uh, that, that's a tough, that's tough. I'm sorry whether you're a historian or not a historian. That just isn't obvious. I agree with that. You know? it, it's the toughest. And, and uh, if you go back to what people probably were thinking, they probably thought it only applied against the federal government and maybe the states would have established, uh, uh, established uh, uh, churches. And, and then what you see is an evolution really in the court's opinions. You see two evolutions taking place at once. Uh, one is that the country's changing. After the Civil War, at the time of the uh, Constitution was written, uh, probably uh, there were maybe a handful of religions. By, by the time you get to today, and after the post-Civil War immigra em uh, immigrations into the United States, we probably have 50 or 60 different religions. There's a tremendous degree of diversity that wasn't there before from a, uh, a religious point of view. And I think what you see in the court's opinions over the 1950s, 60s, uh, 70s, and, and so forth, is the court responding to that in light of what? Well, uh, in light of a basic value that underlies that establishment clause. If you go back into the history of that clause, the religious clauses, they grow out of the civil wars in England. Read about those civil wars. My goodness, you talk about bad things today. I mean, the 17th century was just terrible. And people really killing each other, uh, uh, deadly, deadly, and for religious reasons. And they ended up, in, in, in Britain anyway, with a compromise. And the compromise was, well, you practice your religion and teach it to your children and let me practice mine and teach it to my children. And that was an important compromise because it wasn't just written into religious clauses. It really begins the First Amendment. It really begins free speech. It be it's the font of a great deal of, of intellectual uh, freedom uh, and it shows up everywhere. So if I thought, going back to that very basic value and trying to see how it's reflected in the opinions of our court, it's there. It's there. It's definitely in all the opinions across the 19, the latter part of the 20th century. 
So in the school voucher case, my own view was to try to evaluate the school voucher legislation in light of that. And then for reasons I set out at considerable length for anyone who has insomnia, uh, 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 I feared that to allow the, the, the vouchers would in this society provoke too much religious dissension because people feel religion so strongly, so strongly, uh, that it would provoke too much dissension and disagreement of the kind that that establishment clause, as it had come to be interpreted, would in fact uh, have wanted stopped. See, it's there to, you do yours, you do mine, let's keep that dissension down. Now, the reason I wrote about it in the book, and the reason I went on at length, is because I'll tell you, I, I, and with what I said, I, I wasn't certain of that. I did come to that conclusion. But uh, sometimes I come to a conclusion and I think, you know, and that's it. And uh, time goes on, and as time goes on, I think I'm more and more right. That's human nature. But sometimes there's a conclusion which I, which I am just pretty tentative about and remained, I'm just doing my best. I'm just doing my best. And we're there we are, to, and that's one of them. We're not allowed to pass. No, we're really. not. <laughs> we're not allowed to pass, and, and uh, that's the nature of the thing. And why well, I say the difference is, you know, I grew up at a time when every member of the Supreme Court had been appointed by a president who was a member of the Democratic Party. I thought maybe that's what it was supposed to be. <laughs> but uh, over time, I've learned that there is a virtue. There is a virtue in life tenure on that court and length of service because it does mean that not that a president can control the outcome. No president can, and they shouldn't try. But they sometimes may try to get some kind of basic philosophical which they sort of view, which they think is roughly compatible, and they can be wrong about that one too. But uh, uh, there, you're likely to get, with different presidents, maybe some diversity of view. And, and that's what I think is good uh, in a country, as I said, that is as diverse as ours. Let me, let me say a couple of things. First of all, is a, this is a digression, but it's worth it. Uh, you're, you're right about the, the – I once had a, a, a good uh, friend in, in, in France who, who explained to me the fundamental difference between France and the United States. And once you hear it explained, it's, it, it's very clear. He said, uh, he said uh, Judge Scalia, France is a country with 300 cheeses and two religions. <laughs> the United States is a country with two, che with two cheeses and 300 religions. <laughs> There's a lot to say. Well, I mean, well, my now, only question now, on that is why did the Frenchman have an Italian accent? <laughs> <laughs> my, my comment... At least I try. <laughs> my, my comment on the Establishment Clause is this. Many of its aspects are, are difficult. One aspect is not at all difficult, and my court has, has got it wrong. And it infects all of our cases on the Establishment Clause. Uh, I grew up in New York City and, and uh, went to PS 13. and, and uh, I was part of, of something that was called the release time program. If you had a note from your parents, you could get out on Wednesday afternoon at 2.30 to go for religious instruction at your church or synagogue, okay? And it was a good deal because, you know, you wouldn't hurry to get there. You'd kick cans through the street and whatnot. And everybody else had to stay back in school. This was challenged as violating the Establishment Clause. And... Uh, in an opinion written by William O. Douglas, no, no conservative he, uh, the court said, this is virtually verbatim, quote, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being when the state accommodates its schedule to the religious needs of our people, it acts in the best of our traditions. 
Ten years later, the court did a 180 degree turnaround. And the current law of the Establishment Clause is not only that the state may not favor one, one denomination of religion over another, you know, Catholics over Jews or Muslims over some. No, not only that. Our opinions continue to say repeatedly the state may not favor religion over non-religion. Now, that is just a lie. It, it comports neither with the original meaning of the Establishment Clause nor with the current application of it. The same Congress that proposed the Establishment Clause to the people directed George Washington to proclaim a day of thanksgiving to God for all his blessings upon the American Republic, which he proceeded to do and which is still part of our tradition. And we have cases that have approved paid chaplains in the Federal Congress who open the, the day with a prayer and chaplains in state legislatures. And come to think of it, we open our own session every time we sit with God save the United States and this honorable court. So this notion that uh, uh, the state cannot, f of course the state must be, must be rigidly neutral among the various denominations of religion, but to say that, uh, that, that, that uh, it somehow violates the Constitution for the state to favor religion over non-religion is simply not true. It never was true and it is not true to the, um, until today. And until we get rid of that excrescence, that change from the original meaning of the clause. Uh, we're, we will never make any sense out of it. Do you think you got to the voucher? Have you changed your mind on the voucher case? No, I didn't say I changed my mind. I said it was a difficult case. I, th the, the, uh, the, uh, I, I tried to describe the differences. I had to write something. It was, a, it was a, an article or something, but it wasn't in an opinion. But when I described the differences between the French system and the uh, uh, British and the United States in this area. I said, well, uh, my, said, I'm not, not an expert in these other things, but, but the, the franchise have an idea, they call it laicism, or, and, and it's almost as if the, the uh, 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 non-religion bears a relationship to the modern French state, that Catholicism bore to the French state before the revolution. So that if you have a public official who says a prayer, it's a contradiction in terms. It virtually, it violates the principle. Uh, in England, they believe that an established church is not a violation of basic principles of free religion. Now, my point there is that we have neither of those systems. And when I was forced to describe it, I, which I was for the article, uh, I, I said, well, we have what I think of as a more pragmatic system. That is, we do at the boundaries, at the boundaries. Uh, we do not totally divorce religion from public life. There's a chaplain over in the Senate and so forth. So how do we, with this more pragmatic approach, uh, uh, apply the Establishment Clause, for example, and my description of it is we look at it pragmatically in terms of the basic objective, which was what I described earlier uh, as uh, an objective that's designed to minimize the dissension to the social fabric, to the, to the world in the United States that can come out of real religious conflict. And now that requires judgment, and, and uh, that's why in uh, Ten Commandments cases, I came out one way in one case and the other in the other. Now, it may be that that's hard to apply, which of course it is. Of course it's hard to apply. But we don't have the French system, which is 100% purist. And we don't have the British system either. And so you say it's a hard area, and so do I. But you have resolved it by the purposive approach at its mm -hmm. very highest level of generality, yeah, yeah, which right. shows you the risk of that approach. You say, obviously, the purpose of the Establishment mm -hmm. Clause was to reduce religious controversy. And therefore, what it means is whatever reduces mm -hmm. religious controversy is required by the Establishment Clause. Right. I mean, th that was its purpose, but it didn't say achieve that purpose by any means. It has a text. 
And it seems to me you have to say, yeah, that, well, that was the purpose of the text, but that doesn't mean that anything else which achieves that purpose is therefore required by it. Do you remember you used to have a thing in logic classic called CDNF, conclusion does not follow. <laughs> the fact that you somehow I never took a logic class. I'm sorry. Ah, <laughs> we're making progress. I should, I should have been <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the point I wanted to make is that sometimes, and that's why the Ten Commandments case was hard, but I wouldn't retreat from that at all. I mean, I, I, I felt that, uh, uh, you know, but uh, the, the other one's hard too. But there can come up occasional cases, occasional, and they are occasional where there just is not going to be an answer unless you go back to that basic purpose. And sometimes you'll have to do it in a general way. And that in that case, but not in every case, far from it, in that case, I thought that the display of the Ten Commandments in Kentucky, which involved a kind of deliberate uh, thing to get religion into that courthouse, was in fact prohibited in part because of the circumstances which I set out. But I also thought that the tablets of the Ten Commandments, which had been put in the state fairground, the state the capital ground in Texas with a lot of other non-religious monuments, and it happened to be put there, uh, those tablets, uh, because uh, of Cecil B. DeMille's movie, the Ten Commandments, where he had given money to a secular civic organization called the Eagles uh, to spread the Ten Commandments monuments throughout the country. He thought it would be a good publicity uh, for his film. That's quite true, apparently. And uh, uh, the, uh, they'd been there, there for 45 years. And what I said in the opinion is nobody had ever objected. It was there for other mon with other monuments to show the history of the ideals of the Texans. It went there really for a secular purpose and not for a religious purpose. And, and I thought ultimately um, it would be uh, very disruptive of the value that underlies that establishment clause, either to say that both of these monuments, very different circumstances, were constitutional or to say that both were unconstitutional. And I did look to the value, and I reached agreement on the court in that I was the only one who thought that way. And so I grant you, I grant you that is not on its face a sign that I was right. But, but nonetheless, I wrote down the reasons, and, and uh, uh, that is an instance of having to refer back to the basic purpose uh, underlying the clause. Listen, I was glad to have you come up right in one of the two. <laughs> We've got some questions from the audience, and this follows up on our conversation now for Justice Scalia. If one cannot discern the purpose of a modern Congress, can one discern the will of the framers? Aren't those who focus on the intent of the founders simply imposing their own subjective view of history? Well, you, you never heard me mention the phrase intent of the founders. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Um, I, I take the text of the Constitution and I ask what was it understood to mean by the society that adopted it? And that is very easy to figure out. It is easy as pie to figure out that the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause was not understood to prohibit the death penalty that the due process clause was not understood to forbid laws against abortion and so forth. Uh, you look at the state of the laws which existed at the time and continue to exist with no one claiming that they violated the Constitution. That, that is conclusive evidence of what the society that adopted the Bill of Rights believed it meant. Justice Breyer, you say in your book that Supreme Court justices should interpret the Constitution pragmatically in a way that enhances our democratic system of governance. Should district court and court of appeals judges interpret old Supreme Court precedents like Roe versus Wade pragmatically and in a way that enhances the functioning of our democracy? Pragmatism is a dangerous word because it means to people often just do whatever sort of good and works at the moment, and that isn't how I mean it. I mean, there is a tradition philosophically in America called pragmatism, which is, uh, has roots back to uh, William James and Peirce and others, 
And, and uh, it's, it's a tradition where you have, you can have rules, you can have moral rules, you can have other kinds of rules, and you have to follow them. But if you look at the object of the system as a whole, or you look to uh, uh, the purposes of any subset of rules, uh, they have purposes, and you look at that pragmatically. And that's what I'm thinking of. I mean, when uh, sometimes uh, I'll say, for example, and I'll say it in imagination, but sometimes I'll say it in audience because it puts the thing in a sort of lively way. Uh, I, I say, well, we, we have a document, the Constitution of the United States, that was intended to be more than an exercise in logic. It was intended to be more than a set of words. It was intended to be a set of words that worked to make this country governable. And I, I said that right there in the, you know, I, I signed an opinion in the affirmative action case in, in Grutter that I thought was saying that. It was saying that the country has to work and it's complicated how it works out there. But I say if I, if, uh, you know, there are interpretations of the equal protection clause and there are different ones and I thought that uh, I have one favored and uh, what I wrote about and, and I thought one of the virtues of that is it would help bring our society together. And that was part of the purpose of that amendment. And that amendment had to do with a constitution that was going to work for people in the United States. And then I imagine James Madison is here. And I say, James, I can be quite familiar with him as long as he's not actually here. Uh, <laughs> do you want an interpretation of an important part of that constitution that will, in fact, work in terms of bringing people together and to try to achieve a goal, or do you want one that isn't going to work? Well, since he's not here, I can answer the question <laughs> for him. <laughs> you see, I want one that's going to work and not work. Well, I'm not going into the merits of that particular You don't case. know James Madison. I know James Madison. Yeah. I, I... <laughs> well, I know James Madison in my imagination. And the, oh, forget that. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, the, the point is that in particular clauses and particular, uh, particular purposes and particular ways in which things work out is what I mean by uh, a pragmatic approach towards the Constitution. It isn't just sitting there generally and asking what's good and what isn't good. Ten Commandment cases are a good example because note how I tried to bring it back to the purpose of the clause in terms of what will work to achieve that purpose not just saying what's good for the country in general. Could you respond to that, Justice Scalia? No. Be <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it, it did not provoke anything from me, so I'll, I'll just let it. So many of what he, so many of the things he does say do provoke. <laughs> then I'll let this one go. <laughs> All right, well, let's, we have one for both of you. What do you think of the political term activist judge? Does it apply to judges on both sides of the aisle or just so-called liberal justices? No, it's an insult. I mean, when people use it, they mean it as an insult. They mean it as a judge who's substituting his own opinion for what the Constitution requires. And, and no one wants really serious. Sometimes people might say, I'm an activist judge, but they're doing it in quotation marks in an ironic way. And the, the point that I try to make in the book is, is no one needs activist judges and no one tries to be an activist judge, though we do try uh, to apply different, sometimes, approaches to the Constitution. Right? And uh, I'd say, anyway, if you want to speak generally in political terms, in political terms, we don't need activist judges. We do need activist citizens. And uh, that's what I think the Constitution foresees. And that's really why I wrote this little book, because I, I, I want to encourage people, particularly you know, those in high schools and other places, and, I can, I can use some authority there in having worked with the Constitution for, for, many, for a certain number of years now, uh, to say that I can tell you this about the Constitution. It sets up that democratic system, and that democratic system expects people to participate. And if you don't, you can do what you want, but I'll tell you that document, and this I say professionally, won't work. Now, I say that to high school students. And I say, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying the Constitution won't work. And I say, I know it's a gimmick. I am telling you what to do. But I also think that that participation is important and, uh, you know, et cetera. 
So uh, what I think of activist judges, that's what I think. Justice Scalia, when do you think that the court has crossed the line and decided things that should have been better decided by the political branches, taken away democratic participation? Well, you know, I've, I've explained my approach, and, and I would have to say whenever it gives to the text of the Constitution a meaning different from what it bore when it was adopted. Whenever it does that, it is taking upon itself the role of revising the Constitution, and that's something the people are to do, not the court. Uh, let me say something about activist judges. Uh, I, I agree entirely with, uh, with, with Justice Breyer that uh, it, it's a conclusory label. I mean, you know, wow. Activist judges. You can, it just means any judges that are doing things you think shouldn't be done. Some people, for example, would uh, would would call the uh, the Rehnquist Court an activist court on the grounds that it uh, it struck down a uh, much larger number of federal statutes than the Warren Court had done. Well, you know that's sort of a silly criterion uh, because there is. <laughs> There is such a thing as an activist Congress. And if you're dealing with a Congress that is pushing the envelope all the time, you would want your court to be striking down, uh, even if it's not an activist court. If it's just keeping the traditional bounds of the Constitution, you would want that court to strike down a lot of statutes. So that's no, that's no way to judge the matter. Um, Ultimately, you have to judge it on the basis of what you think uh, judges ought to be doing. I would call a judge an activist judge when, when he, as I say, gives to the Constitution a meaning it did not have when adopted, or gives to a statute a meaning other than its fairest, its fairest uh, interpretation. So when you disagree with Justice Breyer on some of the uh, I cases. would never call him that to his face. <laughs> But Justice and one thing we do is we do, well, sorry. The, but, the, but, sorry. Well, you, don't, you didn't agree with many of those decisions of the Rehnquist Court that struck down some of those acts of Congress. No, I didn't. And, and uh, so that, that's why it's so hard to say that I think one, one or the other of us is, is uh, more likely to pay attention to Congress. I mean, if you look at the numbers in the, in the Rehnquist Court, you'll see, well, probably I was more in favor of the congressional it's statutes quite. than you were. And, and what, where the differences lie, and we're not always on opposite sides, even in this 20% of the thing. But the, the differences are more uh, lie in, 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 in the approach to uh, interpretation. I mean, think of how the Warren Court was criticized for being activist, even in their main decisions, which is absolutely accepted now, that, that main decision that was Brown versus Board. And you know, if you look at it now, you say, my goodness, what could have been more literal? The Constitution says equal protection of the law. It says every citizen is entitled to equal protection of the law. And you, you simply had to, I'm old enough to remember, you know, and you are too, uh, when, when throughout large portions of this country, you know, vast numbers of citizens of the United States of America were, were just treated unequally, that really understates it. They were treated really badly. And anyone who went around and opened his eyes to just look and say, you call that equal protection of the law? Of course it isn't. And what the Warren Court did then was simply say those words of the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, which was aimed to take people at that time in the 1870s who'd been slaves and integrate them into American society. That it was designed to do that, and the words said it, and my goodness, it wasn't being done. And, and there, I think that was a, a literal and purposive and every and historical, anything you want to say. And yet at the time, people said who were opposed to that, oh, this is very activist. Well, of course, it wasn't in any sense whatsoever. So beware of labels. And of course, when you talk about philosophical disagreements, and approaches towards interpretation, one of the wonderful things about an event like this is you're seriously interested in this question. And you can see what real differences there are. And you can think about them and decide what are appropriate in an intelligent way. Well, we're not the CIA over at the Supreme Court. We, we are an open organization 
that tries in every word to put down on paper what we're really thinking so people can read and think about it. And I think that's why we're, we're, we're here, because we think there, there is a real value, a real value in people taking what we're doing seriously, non-politically, uh, trying to understand uh, the philosophical and, and conceptual differences and think about them uh, and discuss them. And as you can tell, we, we both like to talk about it and are, are happy to and do we, so. And we do not yeah. differ as much as our interesting conversation might suggest, mm -hmm. I think, in a vast majority of cases we come out the same way. Uh, it's not it's, all. Huh? Not all. But the vast majority. You're right. Right. The I agree. Vast majority. I agree with you. And, um, I agree with you. The, 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 the course um, uh, came under, obviously, enormous criticism 40, 50 years ago. And now we've uh, seen um, uh, some, Justice O'Connor, for example, uh, again express concern about criticism of the course and concerns about judicial independence. Is that something that troubles you, Justice Scalia? Having engaged in criticism of the courts myself, I can hardly, <laughs> I can hardly say it's a bad idea. Uh, it depends on what the how the criticism uh, is put, uh, whether it is uh, destructive. Just you know, judges are you know terrible, and uh, uh, the court should be ignored uh, or disobeyed or whatever, or whether it's intelligent criticism that uh, that says. Uh, judges are, are, are doing this or that wrong and should adopt a, a, a different approach. Uh, but uh, the, the notion that, uh, that all sorts of criticism are, are improper, I mean, my goodness. Uh, that's why we have life tenure, precisely so that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, let, let this roll off our back. Uh, and it's always been there. John Marshall was criticized much more brutally uh, by the Richmond Papers than, uh, than, than any of the justices on the current court uh, are criticized in the press. And, I mean, it, it cut him so, so deeply that, that, that he wrote anonymous letters replying to the, uh, <laughs> to, the, to the criticism. So it's always been with us, and it should be with us. Uh, the, you know, it's one of the checks on the judiciary. It, it, the, the only check, once you're in office, uh, you know, uh, Criticism from, from the bar, from the academy, and, and from the public. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's healthy to have intelligent, constructive criticism. It is, of course, uh, not healthy to have uh, uh, criticism that just demeans the courts and encourages the people uh, to uh, have contempt for the courts. That's, that, that's not helpful. If I could also, you were saying you, you agree, uh, you, you both seem to agree that you agree on a lot of cases. Our new Chief Justice would actually, and has said, he'd like to see more of that, more unanimity, more narrow opinions so that you can reach. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Lots of luck. <laughs> Of course, that's, that's desirable, and, and I think we work hard to achieve it. Uh, it is, the bar complains sometimes about too many opinions, but it is a very rare case, I mean very rare, in which there is not a majority opinion for the court, signed on to by at least five of us. So the bar knows what the ruling of the case is. Uh, and we work hard. We work hard to do that. Beyond that, uh, you know, you, you can get more agreement, of course, by deciding less. And if you wanted to decide almost nothing at all and decide the case on such a narrow ground that it will be of very little use to the bar in the future, you can get nine votes. So it's, it, it's really always a trade-off between how helpful you want the opinion to, to read. You want it to take on the big question that's really the source of the disagreement in the lower courts. If you do that, it, it's going to be harder to get a, a, a 9 nothing vote. If you want to decide this case on the basis of this little technicality in this case, you know, you'll decide this case, but you won't help the bar at all. And bear in mind that we only take cases to, to help the bar. 
these cases, <laughs> you know, it's our choice whether we take a case or not. We usually take it to solve a problem, a, a disagreement among the lower courts. So to, you know, to take it and then decide the case on such a narrow ground that, in fact, you haven't given any guidance, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather have a 5 to 4 or a 6 to 3 decision uh, that gives that guidance than a 9 to nothing opinion that doesn't. What do you think, Justice Brown? <laughs> I, I was laughing because I thought you said, well, we take these opinions because we want to really help the bar. I thought maybe they don't always see it that way. I think the reason, I, I agree with you on this, the object is to decide the case and you want five people. That's fine. But I, 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 and, and I don't think that uh, you want nine on an opinion for the sake of having nine on an opinion. That, that, that isn't the reason. And you don't want it to be narrow or not narrow, or, uh, et cetera, uh, because of you want to get nine people on it, et cetera. So sometimes you, this is always qualified, but it depends and so forth. But there are good reasons sometimes uh, for deciding things narrowly uh, that have nothing to do with whether we can announce we're unanimous. Uh, for example, uh, a very good example, I think, comes up in some of these technologically advanced areas, uh, uh, privacy, uh, computers, uh, Internet, and, and uh, where if we go too far too quickly, we're going to make some uh, law that then is going to turn out to be an obstacle uh, to something that's necessary or helpful for others to do. And I say that because I think it's important to see that a court, particularly our court, in my opinion, as working best with a new area, and sometimes older areas, when it comes in late in the day. In this democratic country, and it is democratic, and whatever the criticisms are, all those people screaming at each other, I sometimes say there's a very big silver lining in that. Because when people disagree, and they shout even, they should be civil, but even if they shout, they're talking to each other. And when we try in, in the United States to get something passed, whether it's the Patriot Act, whether it's in the area of terrorism, whether it's in the area of computers or, or privacy or anything else, we start with uh, discussing it. And we discuss it here, at schools, uh, in, in, uh, in the newspapers, in journals, in, in seminars, in civil liberties groups, in uh, or police associations, all over the place. And those disagreements are voiced, and they end up in hearings and legislation and administrative rules, and we try them out, and people criticize, and they say maybe we should change it, and, and uh, they try something, it fails, and they change it again 15 times, and then eventually maybe something will settle down and eventually work its way up to the court. And I say this because I think it's important to remember that we're not experts in all these fields, if any. And uh, we work best when we're informed. And we're not going to be informed until fairly late in the day when other institutions have an opportunity to try to work things out. And when they do, and when they have, then uh, you might discover a greater unanimity in our court, uh, not always. Uh, and if before that, you might also discover efforts to write a little narrowly, uh, which are very often, in my opinion, healthy. Do you think they're... Uh, but before you go on, let me go on record, lest I be misquoted or misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, I, am, I am not against narrow opinions. There are good reasons for narrow opinions. One of them is not to get nine votes. That's all I'm saying. Why not? Because that, 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 that's not what we're here for. We're, we're, we're here to solve the difficult problems that are presented by these cases. And where mm -hmm. such a problem is within our reach, it has been argued before us, and we can decide that problem so that it will not be a source of confusion in future cases, we should do it rather than deciding the case on another issue that has come up, a side issue, which would dispose of the case and would dispose of it un unanimously. I do not think the value of disposing of that 
unimportant issue unanimously exceeds the value of disposing of the major issue for which we took the case. Simple as yeah, that. that. That's not bad because I, I, I've said this sometimes and I haven't quite, I think that articulates some, something I've felt quite a lot and I say it as a kind of joke and it, but it certainly describes psychologically I think how I feel all, and I bet you do too. You write an opinion, a uh, draft and send it around the court and then you're never certain how people will react. You're just never certain. And uh, the votes begin to come in, and a as they do come in, I, I, people often have suggestions for change, and I usually say to an audience, and I'm very, very open to those changes. Uh, they want me to change, and I'll try and do my best, and then I finally, if I get those five votes, I say, I'm still amenable to change, but not quite as amenable. <laughs> a very wise position. <laughs> What about boldness? Boldness, you mean? In opinion writing. Oh, I thought you meant italics or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think the law doesn't have to be dull. There is no reason for it to be dull, especially dissents. Sometimes, ma <laughs> Sometimes majority opinions have to be dull because you have to get your colleagues to jump on board. But uh, I think putting things uh, in, a, in a fetching way, <laughs> in a memorable way, uh, is all to the good, especially, especially in dissents. Well, who were you writing for in dissents? I mean, what, what is the purpose of a dissent on the Supreme Court? On the Court of Appeals, it has some function. I mean, you, you are warning off other circuits that this opinion is not a good opinion to follow. It's faulty, okay? It has that fun. You're also warning the Supreme Court. Maybe you should take this case because they've decided it wrong. But what good does it do to dissent at all on the Supreme Court? You've had your, your day. You've, uh, you've argued with your colleagues. You failed to persuade them. The game's over. It is over. So who are you writing the dissent for? I'm writing it uh, 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 mainly mainly for uh, the, the, what should I say, the educational value it can have uh, because when, uh, when law professors put together case books, they have to have two sides. It's no fun to have just one side. <laughs> so they're going to put in the dissent. And if you can make the dissent readable, it'll be in the book and the students will read it. And it and it has that educational value. Because frankly, you know, my, my philosophy, uh, originalism used to be orthodoxy. It is not anymore. There are, very few, there are only two certified originalists on the court, uh, uh, Clarence Thomas and I. Uh, I don't hope to persuade my current colleagues or or even the current bar, it's too late for you guys. I mean, you, you, <laughs> but maybe the next generation. Maybe we can get back to what used to be orthodoxy. And that's, uh, that's one reason. Uh, I try to write uh, dissents that are not only clear, but also interesting and occasionally even fun. So. Did you find yeah. Justice Scalia's dissent in Morrison versus Olson persuasive? I wasn't on the court. I know. You were, an acad you, were the, you were his audience. I, I, I didn't teach uh, in that field. I, I taught in a very, very exciting field, uh, economic regulation. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't get I thought it was an excellent dissent, but I didn't read it until later. So uh, there we are. I, I, many of it, I, I like reading his He dissents. likes my dissents. No, yeah. no I don't know. I, no, I write a dissent. I, I write a dissent, and first I think, you know, it's going to persuade them. I mean, it hasn't before, but I go home and say to my uh, Joanna, I say, well, you know, I've written a dissent, and, and uh, you know, it's, I know, I, I, uh, this time it really will, and uh, then she says, <laughs> she says, I've heard that one before, and, 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 and uh, then uh, pretty soon, that sometimes quickly, sometimes, I, I shift from it will persuade them to it should have persuaded them, and then uh, from it should have persuaded them, I say, well, I've written it, haven't I? I mean, you know, and uh, who knows, maybe there is someone who will uh, gather benefit from it. It's, it's pretty hard when you, when you think through something uh, uh, 
uh, carefully, and then you... Uh, I hope everyone's turned his cell phone off here. <laughs> this seems to be ringing, so I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> 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 but, uh, all right. You know, there's an old saying that a new justice <laughs> makes a new court. Have you uh, um, noticed a lot of changes? We've got two now. Oh, it's always nice to have new colleagues. Uh, you miss the old ones. Um, I, I wouldn't say it changes the whole court. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it changes some of the dynamics, some of the group dynamics. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's fair to say it changes the court. Have you noticed a difference at, at argument or even in more discussion in your conferences? How's, how's it different up there? I, I think the chief is a little, uh, a little more lenient at, at conference, but I think he'll get over that. <laughs> <laughs> so he lets Justice Breyer talk more. <laughs> no, no I just think it takes a certain period in office to acquire the kind of arbitrary manner that is appropriate for a chief justice. <laughs> <laughs> How have you seen the new chief difference in no, the it's, old? It's fine. I mean, we, 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 we all get on well, and, and uh, there is a little bit more discussion. <laughs> we don't know. I mean, he, he's, he, yeah, I, I like it. I, I think it's fine. I, mean, I like a little bit more discussion. It's marginally, marginally more. So is more discussion after you have more interaction, after everyone has their say? Yeah, a little bit more, a little bit more. Does that mean Justice Breyer does more talking? <laughs> I think it, it means all of us are able to do more talking. Oh, good. There's a very good rule there for really any organization. We've had this, and most of you know it. In, in the conference, the, the rule is uh, we go around in order, and it starts with the chief, and then... Uh, Justice Stevens, Justice Scalia, uh, Justice Kennedy, uh, uh, Justice Souter, Justice Thomas, uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, me, and, and, and now Justice Alito. We go in order and briefly and succinctly uh, state our points of view, and then there's back and forth discussion. The rule is no one speaks twice until any, everyone speaks once. Now, I was junior, so that benefited me, and it still does. But uh, that's a very good rule. I think it promotes good feeling. I, I, th I think everyone feels uh, uh, fairly treated, and, and uh, uh, no one doesn't, no one goes without a say. And uh, I, I like it. I think that works well. And I, I'd say you're right in saying now back and forth. There's a little bit more back and forth, as long as you feel it's productive. It, it well, we, when you say you feel it's productive, the, the former chief wrote a book in which he said and, uh, that, that conference is really a misnomer, that it isn't... Uh, it isn't an attempt to persuade one another. It is, it is mostly uh, each justice setting forth his or her views, and uh, um, the major function of it is, is not to change other people's votes because they come in with their minds made up, but rather uh, you take notes so that you know the theories that the other justices have of the case. If you are so unfortunate as to be assigned the case, you will know how to write it in a way that will get at least four other votes, which is the name of the game, right? Um, I, I'm not telling you this. This, this, this was in the chief's in the chief's book, and it, it was an accurate description. And, and if if you're under the impression that there is a a major effort to persuade one another at these conferences, uh, you're, you're mistaken. In the days when I first came on the court. Uh, we, we were hearing twice as many cases as we hear today. Uh, so in one week, we would hear 12 cases. We would discuss and decide eight of those cases on Friday morning. We would discuss and decide those eight cases and vote on the cert petitions that had accumulated over the last week and be done by lunch. So if you have these image of these philosophers, you know, reasoning with one another that, that this is not what is going on, and I doubt that it is what could possibly go on uh, with as large a group as nine. It, it's, it, it's just, just too cumbersome. Uh, when I came to the Supreme Court from the Court of Appeals, I, I, I told my former colleagues, there's good news and there's bad news up here. 
the good news is you don't have to take every case. You know, in the Court of Appeals, you have to take it. It's an appeal from the district court. The bad news is every time you take one, it's in bank. <laughs> all, all nine of you. And boy, you know, when you sat on the, you hated the in banks on the Court of Appeals. It's so much easier to sit with two other judges and you can really, you know, knock the case back and forth and really, you can't do it with nine people. It's just not doable. And, and Holmes said that. He said, you know, after the court went above five, it, 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 it just became a different enterprise. I, I think conference does. I mean, it, views change sometimes. I, I've seen views change, and I've seen the way in which people see the case change. People do listen to each other. They're not, and you can say a great deal in a short time. I learned uh, a good lesson, in a way, from, and it's worth from uh, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who soon pointed out it isn't the quantity of what you say, it's the quality. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can say a lot in a few words, where you're focused and thinking just about the main point that you're trying to explain to people. So there doesn't have to be a long discussion, and people do listen uh, for uh, uh, something to shape uh, a view, and, and sometimes really, uh, sometimes, not a lot, but, uh, but sometimes really change uh, an opinion. Well, on that, I think we're going to have to say thank you to both of our justices, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.